Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. See, God's word is just not like every other word that you hear around town. God's word is full of power. And God's word will get into your heart and it's like, it's like a bomb is deposited there. And it's a good bomb. And it goes, and it like changes. There's a reaction on the inside, and it changes you and I from the inside out. What his word, you know, in one scripture, it says this. It says that he watches over his word. And why does he watch over it? It says he watches over it to perform it in your life. He, he's looking for, you know, ways he can just show up and perform it right in your life. He's the performer. Isn't that cool? He's the, sometimes we've thought we've had to be the performer. You know, we've had to juggle plates and, and, and you know, dancing bears come out and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you know, God's the performer. He looks at his word and he says, I want to perform that, you know, in, in their life. Hallelujah. That's what, that's what it's like. That's what Christianity's like. Isn't that amazing? You know, issues that we face today, we need to apply the word of God to them. You know? Now, it is not a magic wand, okay? It's not like you go out and you go, whoosh, whoosh, and a little fairy dust flies or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is we, we're going through challenges in life we find out what God's word says about it. We fix our eyes on it. We feed on that. And it becomes reality. It changes circumstances. It, have you, anybody ever had that happen? Anybody ever faced something in life and you thought, I don't know how I'm going to get around that or how gonna, that's going to come about? You know, I remember just coming to this church feeling that way. How's that going to happen? You know? I remember, you know, many issues in life when I sat back and scratched my head, said, how in the world is that going to work out? And I've come to trust God, to trust him. And he performs. He works. It's not like we have him, you know, he's not like at our disposal. We just tell him what to do. No, he's already said it. We're taking him at his word. We're taking him at his word. All right. That was all free. Deuteronomy 28 is where I want to start today. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 28, 13. Moses is talking here, and this is what Moses is declaring to the children of Israel. He says this, The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and not beneath. Now, as he was saying these words to them, he was declaring this covenant that God was calling them to walk in. And he says, this is a good thing for you. God is going to make you the head, not the tail, above only and not beneath. How many think that sounds pretty good? I didn't think that way before I was saved. I thought, man, if you ever became a Christian, your days of fun are over for sure. You know, I thought life was, was reduced to walking around, you know, maybe singing some hymn, you know, that, that I heard my grandmother sing. God bless her, she's in heaven, you know. But, but, you know, that's what I thought it would be like the rest of my life. If I ever got, to, you know, be a Christian, I thought, wow, God doesn't know how to have fun. But that's quite the opposite. The truth is, is that when you become a Christian, you have the power of God working in your life. And he's there with you everywhere you go. He's there to cause you to rise up in life. He's got you back. He's got you covered. He watches out for you. See, our job is to learn to depend on him, to learn to take him at his word, to put our trust in him. No matter what it looks like out here, I'm going to trust God. Easier said than done, you know, but I tell you, that's, that's where the victory's at. So we've been in this series, and we call it Under and Over. Under and over, you know, what does that bring to mind to you, under and over? You know, you might be, might come to your mind, Dick Tracy. Remember Dick Tracy? When I was a kid, we watched a cartoon called Dick Tracy. And you know the cool thing about Dick Tracy was? 
he had this watch. He was so ahead of the times. I mean, I watch. Dick Tracy had one, and he would, he, this is what he would talk into. He'd say, all right, chief. And then he'd say, over and out. So that's what popped into my head when I read it this morning. But originally what popped into my head about this under and over is, again, being a kid, I'm kind of like a big kid anyway. But, but when I was a kid, and I think you'd probably agree, sometime in our lives we've all kind of been there where it was a cool thing to go on a swing set. And, and, you know, the coolest swing sets around when I was a kid were the ones at the schoolyard or at the park because they were, they were built into cement and they had big, tall arches, you know, and you're, you'd go really high when you'd swing on them things. And, you know, you could work those things up, you know, by kicking your legs out and pulling them back, and you could get going pretty good. But if you were in really good shape, you had a friend there, and they would push you. I mean, was that almost like cheating? I mean, they would push you. Now, you'd work with them, and, man, you'd reach for the stars every time you went out there. And, and, but, but when they really got you going well, what they'd do is they'd push you so hard that they'd run underneath you. And they called that an underpush. And what we're talking about are under pushes from God's word that'll cause us to reach for the stars. It'll cause us to rise up in life. We're talking about unders that will put you over. Unders that put you over. Does that sound all right? I mean, we've talked about a few different unders, being under grace and being under the shadow of the Almighty. I tell you, that's a great one. I love that one. Being under the shadow of the Almighty. That's Psalm 91. You know, wherever we go in life, we got to know that God has got our back. He's covering us. He's, we're under his shadow. That's a good place to live. I remember one time, here, I'll get to the message. One time, when Dana and I lived in Haiti, and, and we lived in Haiti in a very tumultuous time, because they went through, I think every time in Haiti is tumultuous. <laughs> but when we lived there, they went through what they called a revolution. And, and you know, they had this dictator who recently passed away. But uh, his name was Devalier. They called him Baby Doc because the Devalier family had ruled Haiti for many decades. First, Papa Doc, who was a ruthless man. He would, you know, if you were on his bad list, I mean, he'd do anything. He'd kill you, torture you, all that stuff, you know. And, and, and uh, he had a little private army. Just, you know, they called them the Ton Ton Makuts. Did you get that? That's what they called his little private army. And I tell you, you know, if he wanted you, they'd go out and pick you up. One time they came, here I am, I'm on a side journey. I'm on another side. One time they came to our house and they held us under house arrest for a whole night. Because in our garbage, which we burned, we had a pit at the end of the yard where we burned garbage, we had some paint cans, aerosol paint cans in there, and they exploded. And the neighbors called the Tone Tone Makuts, and they said we were terrorists. <laughs> blowing up bombs. So they came and, and they, they, were, they were somewhat friendly to us because we were Americans. It carried some clout. But they held us, you know, under gun, guns to, to not leave the premises. They sat there, like four of them. And thank God he had our back. They went out and they examined the burning pit that we had. This is like at one in the morning. They're out there with flashlights looking and the, right on top of the whole thing there was these cans that had exploded and they saw what had happened and they said, oh, they let us go. They said, you're free. They actually had a couple of our, our people that worked with us imprisoned until this moment and then they freed them. But uh, we were under house arrest. But I was thinking about is when Dana and I were there, you know, we had... We were there during the revolution. I remember one, one day, we just felt impressed. We had a couple that were staying with us, and, and, and uh, we, I just said, hey, guys, let's just go march around the whole perimeter of our yard. And some of you have been down there to Haiti, and it's the same yard it was then. We just walked the perimeter where the, where the fence was, and we walked all the way around it. We actually, you know, we prayed the whole time. We marched around it, and, and we just thanked God for his protection. We thanked him for his protection, and it was just in the next few days that the revolution happened, and I'm telling you, chaos broke out, 
and, and there was like, you know, curfews and all this stuff. Our neighbor, our next door, our closest neighbor was a Tonton Makut. And when this happened, yeah, you know, you guys that have been there, it's where the, the market is now. They tore his house down. They leveled it and they, they put it in the market, which brought in a lot of rats and things. But anyway, but anyway, this, this Tonton Makut, I mean, when, when the revolution happened, I mean, it was like deer hunting season in Wisconsin, and they've got the target painted on them. And uh, I mean, it was a, I watched from my upper level, the second floor of our house, I watched a crowd assemble outside his gate and had a, a, a big log, and it was like in the cartoons. They were ramming his gate, trying to break in. And, and uh, he was in his yard, he had a pistol. Every now and then he'd shoot a bullet in the air, and, crowded kind of back up and then they grab the log and they're like bam bam you know I should have known something was up because for months before this whole thing started this guy was reinforcing his wall putting in stronger <laughs> and then what happened is the military called a curfew and that meant you get off the streets and what would happen if you didn't obey and didn't go off the street you know what anybody know what happened they had trucks full of soldiers that would patrol the streets and they had machine guns. And if you're on the streets that go, eh, only it was for real. So you know what? You got off the street. And, and uh, anyway, that night, the, the next morning, they, they, that guy had escaped and they totally demolished his, his, his fence and just looted his, his house. And, and it was crazy wild. We took pictures. And uh, Dana was putting on her makeup putting on her makeup, and uh, it was in the second story of our house, and there's kind of like a ridge that's big enough you can walk on, and it's still like that. Stephen was walking her all around it, I tell you. But anyway, um, she's putting on her makeup, and, and I, I don't know where, I was off in the house somewhere, and I heard Dana scream, and in her mirror, she could see out the window, and a soldier with a machine gun was walking the ledge of our, of our, of our house. And, and she screamed and ran into the hall. And, and then, then uh, you know, I'd been taking pictures, and they were mad at me for taking pictures. I said, okay, no more pictures. When they're shooting a machine, pointing a machine gun at you, you say, all right, no more pictures. <laughs> But I remember all that while, you know, things were just going so chaotic. I mean, that's more chaotic than it is in my neighborhood right now. <laughs> but we had an unusual peace because we knew we were under the shadow of the Almighty God, under his shadow. So that's not at all what I'm going to talk about today. But if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll talk about another under that'll put us over. Another under that'll put us over. There's many, there's many in the word, but the one we're talking about today is living under the blood. Living under the blood. Now, if you've never heard, you know, talk about the blood of Jesus before, your mind might go tilt, and you'll say, what is that pastor talking about? Blood, blood, is it, I mean, isn't that a gang in New York? Blood, the blood, the blood? No, I'm talking about the blood. I'm talking about the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and I. His blood, you know, it, it, is, the, it is the seal of our covenant. And his blood speaks over our lives today. His blood bought our freedom. And, and you know, some people get, get free and they don't even know they're free, but I'm talking about living in a consciousness. I'm talking about living under the blood. Being aware of what belongs to us. Does that sound all right? Yeah. I'll tell you, we, we are blood slingers at our house. You know what I'm talking about? We are blood slingers, man. When things go on, you get Dana. I mean, goodness. I mean, isn't I right? These guys used to be in a band. You know, my daughters and Stephen and some other young, young people, uh, they were in a band, and they would go on tours, you know. They'd, they'd fill up the trailer, and they'd pack up our, an expedition, and, and, and they'd, they'd, you know, they'd have every kind of grocery we could cram into that place, you know. 
And, and before they ever could pull out of our driveway, Dana would go out there. And, and a couple of these guys, they, they weren't like totally in tune, you might say at that point. But we would just go out there, Dana and I, and Dana's, Dana's mama, you know, she says, you're not going until we pray. And they'd be, you know, the engines running. They're like ready to go. And Dana would be like, I plead the blood over these guys. And they're like, what, what's she doing? What's she doing? I plead the blood. I plead the blood. No, no evil's coming near them. I plead the blood over them. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, their eyes are big like, whoa, what's, what's going on here? Karen, Karen Casey are like, yep, mom, yep. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it works, doesn't it? It works. I'll tell you what, it kept them safe and protected. Hallelujah. The blood works. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, for as much as you know, you guys know this, that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver, gold, uh, from your vain conversations that you receive from the traditions of your father, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Peter is saying here, you know, first of all, he, he, he calls our old way of life a vain conversation. Now, I wouldn't say it that way today, but, but what, what I might say it would be like this. If I was writing my translation of it, I might use these words. I might say, he, brought, he bought you out of an empty lifestyle. Would you guys agree with that? Before you got born again, you know, you might have, there might have been moments of fun, but I'm telling you what, in the whole scheme of it, we were living empty lifestyles. But Jesus' blood was shed for us, and, and it wasn't like you could have been purchased with silver and gold. It isn't like you could go there and say, all right, I've got 15 gold bars. I'm buying my freedom. It wouldn't work. You might say, well, I'm going to just be good. I'm, I'm going to go to that church, Liberty Christian Center. I'm going to be good. I might even be an usher. And I'm telling you, when, when Stephen plays music, I'm going to go like this. I'll tell you what, that doesn't earn your salvation. That'll never earn your salvation. Nothing but the blood of Jesus could purchase your freedom and my freedom. We might, you know, some things are good. Some things are good that we can do, and that's, that's all right, but it doesn't purchase salvation. Salvation came at a very high cost. And we're living today on the other side of that payment. You know, I like to think of it, you know, like you ever, you ever walking out of a, a store nowadays and the buzzer goes off on you? Do you ever have that happen? Oh, don't you hate that? The buzzer, I mean, that, I mean, stores, I mean, being in airports, I used to be notorious for setting off the buzzer even before they put in these new radar machines or whatever they are. I'd always set it off. You know how many pocket knives I lost going on airplanes? <sighs> But walking out of stores, you know, it's like a buzzer goes off and you feel like the whole store is going to come out. The detectives are going to come out. They're going to tackle me and, oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Jesus' blood paid the price for you and I. We don't have to have fear walking through any door because his blood has redeemed us. The price has been paid to the full. When we pull out the, the, the blood, we're pulling out the receipt for our salvation. We're saying, Paid in full. Paid in full. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Most people know this story about blood that was shed. You see, blood, I mean, is a big deal. In our westernized culture, things like this have been belittled. But I'm telling you what, you get in other cultures, they know the power of blood. They know it. Other countries of the world, I'm telling you what, we'll talk about some in a minute, but, but they know about blood. And, and in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 3, can I just start there? It says, you know, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take uh, to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him... And his neighbor next to his house, take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Let me stop there for a minute. 
where we're talking about, the time in history that this is being proclaimed is when the children of Israel were in Egypt. All right, They weren't just in Egypt. They weren't just hanging out in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. They were bound. They, were, they, were task, they had taskmasters that would make them work and sweat. You know, just, you know, I mean, I tell you, it would be totally against the law today. But they were, they were suffering. And they were crying out to God for a deliverer. God heard their prayers, and Moses came on the scene. And God worked through Moses, and, and he brought deliverance to the children of Israel. You know, it started off, he went before the Pharaoh, who was a man that was feared by everyone, and Moses went to the Pharaoh, and he, he stood up and he said, let my people go. And you remember, you, you probably saw the movie, you know, and you know, Moses had this rod, and he threw it down on the ground, and what happened, it became a snake. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, I could go for that kind of action, you know, throwing a rod down, have it be a snake, that'd be neat. And then the magicians came in and they did something similar, but Moses' rod, who had been turned into a snake, it went and ate up all the other snakes. You know, and Moses just grabbed that snake by the tail and it became a rod again. I mean, that that's, was rad. But things like, you know, this were being shown and demonstrated, you know, plagues came on, on of Egypt and, and Pharaoh was hard-hearted and he wasn't letting the people go. And finally, there was one plague that was going to be brought upon Egypt, upon all the people there, and it was this, that the firstborn of every family was going to die. Now that's terrible, and, and, and the firstborn out of every family was going to die. And, and this didn't just hit the, the Egyptians, this would have hit the, the, the children of Israel too, because God had to provide a way of deliverance for them. And this is where we're, we're, we're picking up here, is he's, he's given them the way that they can avoid this plague on them. It says in verse 5, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, take the blood, strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they eat it. Let me just say this right now, that they took the blood of a lamb, you know, that was without spot, but, and they took that blood and they probably used a brush and put it above the door and the sides of the door, but today there's a lamb that shed his blood, and we don't take a brush and put it above our door, but I'm telling you what, by the, by the faith in your heart and the words of your mouth, you declare it over your life and over your properties. And, you know, another thing I want to point out is this. It says this, that the, the, the one that was on inspection here was always the lamb. It says the lamb must be without spot, without blemish, you know, 14 days, all this stuff, all this criteria was for the lamb, not the house. What the devil will come and do is he tries to turn this on you and I to where we're under the microscope. But let me tell you, friends, our eyes need to be on Jesus, not on us. Even if we've done everything right, they can't be on us. They've got to be on him or we're destined to fail. It says, it says you, you need to eat it. They, they went on to talk about how they don't want you to boil it. You don't want you to eat it raw. No sushi lamb, you know, or whatever. It had to be roasted. And then in verse 11, and, and then it said too, if there's anything left in the morning, you need to burn it. You need to throw it in the fire and burn it. There'll be nothing, no take-home bags for this one. I'm telling you what, there is a power here that's being transmitted, a delivering power. And, you know, it's not about, you know... The lamb, it's about the power of God here. And it says in, in verse 11, it says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall make haste to eat it. It is the Lord's Passover. So here's what he told him. He says, while you're eating this lamb, he says, be ready for change. Be ready for change. I mean, have your expect... You, I tell you what, if I get my shoes on, I'm expecting to leave the house. 
Do you know that? In fact, if I get up in the morning and after I've drank my coffee, you know, if, if our dog sees me go and put on my tennis shoes, you would not believe the excitement in our house. It's like, woo, 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 shaking everywhere. and woo, 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 woo. He thinks he's going on a walk. God says, listen, guys, be expectant. Be expectant. Have faith in the blood that was shed. I don't care what the situation looked like. I mean, these people were in a bad situation. They were bound up. They were, they were, they were slaves. Not a pretty picture. But God says this blood is going to make a difference. Come, eat it, expecting. In verse 23 of the same chapter, it says, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and strike you. The blood, the blood. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Almost all things are by the law purged, with blood and without the shedding of blood there's no remission without the shedding of blood you know in the garden you know when when Adam and Eve sinned and they ate the fruit it says they covered their themselves with leaves but leaves you know the 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 self effort that they put out wasn't what it took to cover their condition God came along and killed and took the skins of animals and covered them. And you no, know, did that make them righteous? No, but I'm telling you what, there's no redemption without the shedding of blood. Now, I said this before, but let me tell you, in other countries, they recognize the power of blood and they recognize the power of blood covenant. How many have ever heard of David Livingston? You know, he was, you know, I'm going to read you a little bit here. David Livingstone, Livingston, I always say it that way anyway, was a celebrated African explorer and missionary. After many years in Africa, he was lost sight of, and it was generally believed that he was dead. But there was a man named James Gordon Bennett. He was the proprietor of the New York Herald, and he sent a young reporter who was afterwards known as Sir Henry Stanley with an open account to go and search out and find Dr. Livingston. And of course, you know, we have the famous words when Stanley finds Livingston, he says, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Anybody heard that? Anyway, famous stuff. So in any case, this young reporter goes to Africa in search of Dr. Livingston. And it said this, that, that in Stanley's uh, adventure, you know, in his quest to find Dr. Livingston, it said that he cut covenant with at least 50 tribes in his search. 50 times he cut covenant. He cut covenant. Now, there were three main reasons for cutting covenant, okay? Do you want to hear the three? Yeah. All right, two of you do. Okay, we'll give it to you. No. <laughs> the first one, this, was, this is interesting is when a weaker tribe would come up to a stronger tribe, that would be a reason for cutting a covenant. Because if the weaker tribe could cut covenant with the stronger tribe, that meant they were no longer enemies. In fact, they were in this thing together. They were on the same team. Another reason you would cut the covenant would be for a business deal. They would, they would cut the covenant, and it would, would solidify a business deal. Really, in our culture, some of these things have their roots in blood covenant, and we don't even think about them, but really the handshake. Is, is, is from blood covenant talk and, and, and culture. A handshake, you know, what, what was that all about? Well, if someone was going to make a deal, they said, hey, I'm going to give you 50 bucks for that thing. And you might, the other person might look at them and say, can we shake on it? What that meant is, man, we're coming into agreement on this thing. Well, it, it has its roots in blood covenant. So a business deal was another reason that people would cut the covenant. And the third one was for an expression uh, entering into, into a covenant of love and devotion. 
And, you know, we would look at that as a marriage or, or maybe two good friends would have a covenant because they loved each other. Actually, Jonathan and David would fall under that category. And they cut covenant because of their love for each other and, and, and their concern for each other, okay? All right, with all that, here's how a covenant ceremony went down. The first thing that would happen if someone was going to cut the covenant is is they would exchange gifts, okay? This was just, I mean, some variation might happen with different tribes, but generally, this is how they did them. The first thing that happened was they exchanged gifts. And by exchanging gifts, what they were saying is this, that everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine. So they'd, the first thing they'd do is they would, they would exchange gifts. The next thing they would do is they would drink a glass of wine. And in that wine were usually a couple drops of their blood. So they would, they would have that as part of the ceremony. They would drink this wine. And then often they would do is they would put their wrists together and let their blood mingle. That was another part of this ceremony. And then the last thing that I have here is they would plant a tree or they would make a pile of rocks and this would be a memorial to the covenant that they'd entered into. Now with all that said, I want to tell you about one particular time that Stanley cut the covenant. And it was with a, 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 there was this big tribe in Africa and Stanley came up to them and these people were feared they were they were big I mean did didn't want to mess with them and the good news was is the chieftain of the tribe was willing to cut covenant with Stanley but the first thing in this order of ceremony that was going to go down is this exchange of gifts and so when they did it that what did the chieftain want he looked at what Stanley had, and Stanley had a goat. And he says, I want the goat. So, you know, to, co- to follow through with this, Stanley had to give this chieftain his goat. I mean, sounds simple, doesn't it? But you see, Stanley had an ulcer, and he was dependent on the, the milk from the goat for his sustenance. So it was a big deal for him to give up this goat. You know, I like goats. I even have eaten quite a few. They're pretty tasty, you know. But to Stanley, it was a whole new level. So he gives this chieftain his goat. And you know what Stanley got in return? A big stick. It was a seven-foot stick. And on the top of it, there was some copper that was bound around the top. And Stanley's thinking... Hey, I gave you my goat, and you're giving me a stick with copper wound around the top? And they went through the whole ceremony. They entered into covenant. What Stanley found after leaving that is anywhere he went, and he had that stick, people were in submission to him. Because they realized this, if I mess with that guy, I'm messing with that tribe, and I'm not going to do it. Stanley wrote that in all his exploration, all his his travelings, he'd never found the covenant to be broken. For to break a blood covenant was a death sentence. It was so severe, it was so, you know, it was held in such high honor that if you broke the blood covenant, your own family would search you out and kill you. I mean, how radical is that? That's radical. But that's how strong the blood covenant was looked at. What are we talking about today? We're talking about living under the blood. The good news is we've entered into that kind of a relationship with God. I'll tell you, everything he has is is ours and everything we have is his. We didn't even have to shed the blood. Jesus shed his blood for us. He did it. It was a legal thing and it's done. It's paid for. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, let me read here. It says in Hebrews 9, 11, that Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves. 
You see, up until Jesus, in, in, in the, the children of Israel, they had systems built in to, to you know, declare righteousness over them where the priests would go and they'd make sacrifices, blood sacrifices, cows would be killed, goats would be killed, you know, or sheep would be killed and, and pigeons and turtle doves and things like that. And they'd do it repetitively year after year because none of those things could wipe out sin. But Jesus came, it says this, it says, not by the blood of bulls or goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. If the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer, the sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ how much more shall the blood of Christ, who was offered once and for all for us? I'm telling you what, sometimes in church on Christmas holiday, we preach, you know, Bethlehem messages and all that. Come here, we're preaching the resurrection. We're preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. Come out Wednesday night. We'll have a nice Christmas little service, okay? All right, John chapter 20. I just want to point out an interesting scenario that takes place. I'm going to tell it to you. Here's the deal. Jesus died on a cross. He's buried in a tomb. And, and Mary is, is one that loved Jesus, you know. She was a close follower. And she's at the sepulcher weeping. She's crying. An angel has come and appeared to her. I mean, that would brighten your day. But, I mean, she's in deep grief. And, 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 and the next thing you know is Jesus appears to Mary. How good is Jesus? He appears to Mary, and, and Mary's like, wow, you know, she thinks he's the gardener or something. And Jesus, Jesus says, Mary, here's, here's what I want you to catch. And it's in, um, in verse 17, if you're writing notes, John 20, 17. Jesus said to her, don't touch me. Was he in a bad mood that day? <laughs> Don't touch me. Come on, what do you do? I mean, you know, I hadn't seen Casey in a few months. First thing I did, I saw Casey, is we gave her a hug. I said, Casey, so good to see ya. Mary's just wanting to touch Jesus. He says, Don't touch me. All right, well, later in the day, just remember that. He says, Don't touch me. He went on to say, Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to your father and my father. And then he goes on. And, and, and later in that same day, the disciples are gathered together, but not Thomas. Not Thomas, he wasn't with them. But the disciples are gathered together and Jesus appears to them all. You know, it's one of them times where they're in the room and the doors are shut and he walks through the wall and there he is. I mean, cool stuff. I mean, I like that, I dig that. And, and Jesus hangs out with the guys. And then, Later, eight days later, is what I want to really point to. It's in, it's in the same chapter, but in, in verse 26, again, the disciples are all gathered together. It's eight days later now. Eight days, and, and this time Thomas is with them. Well, the first time when the disciples told Thomas about the whole event, you know, he said to them, he says, well, listen, guys, right, right. Jesus appeared, right, yeah, I saw him die on the cross. You think I'm going to believe you and you say Jesus appeared to you? He says, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in the print of the nail and put my hand on his side where the spear was thrust. I'm not going to believe it. So eight days later, Jesus appears again, and this time Thomas is with him. And the first thing Jesus does is he goes to Thomas. What does he do? Does he rebuke him? Does he say, you faithless little, little booger, what are you doing? He says, no, Thomas. He says, here, take your hand. Put it in the print of the nail. Take your hand. Put it in the, the side where the spear went in. And don't be faithless, but believe. Now, I bring all that up to point this out. When Mary met him, he said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father and your father. And then when the disciples saw him, he walked through the wall, stood in their midst. Eight days later, it's so specific that Thomas, his, his, his request is, is granted, and Jesus says, touch me, touch me. 
Let me read one more. Later, in Luke 24, um, can I read you this one? Just bear all those other things in mind. Uh, This is the two guys that are walking on the road to Emmaus. And, you know, they, 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 their word hasn't traveled everywhere that Jesus is raised from the dead, but these guys are walking, and they're having a talk, and, and, and Jesus joins them and explains all these things to them about the Bible and about, about redemption. And it says this, they're, they're referring to it, and, and um, it says that they, as they spoke, Jesus stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you, and they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see that I'm a spirit. Uh, a spirit doesn't, or see that I'm not just a spirit, for a spirit has not flesh and bones. I was reading that, that just stood out to me. Has not flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Now, and then he showed him his hands and his feet, and they were believed, they had joy and all this stuff. But, but here he says, see that I have flesh and bones. What do you guys say? We usually say flesh and blood. So what had happened is when Mary saw Jesus, he had just been raised from the dead, he said, don't touch me. See, he ascended up into to heaven after he saw Mary. And what he did is he presented his blood on the heavenly holies of holies, he did that once, once and for all. You see, because, you know, things had to be followed according to, to, you know, strict guidelines. And, you know, Mary couldn't touch him because he was going into a holy place to do a holy job. I remember when the priests would go into the temple and, and present the blood. Remember that? They had to tie a rope around their ankle. Remember that? Because, you know, if, if they goofed it up and did it wrong, they, they died in there. And it was the hardest thing in the world to get volunteers to go in and drag out that dead body. It was really tough, you know. And so they said, I got an idea. We're going to tie a rope around his ankle. That guy goes in there. We don't hear the the bells ringing anymore. Just yank that baby out. So Jesus went and he shed his blood. And he presented it once and for all for you and I. Sin is not a problem anymore. I'm telling you what, anything that's, that's... plaguing us, that's trying to grip us and control us, the blood has bought our freedom. It's bought our freedom. We're as free, we're, we're freer than the children of Israel after they cross the Red Sea. We're freer than that. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.